I would observe to him that perhaps his anxiety, that really his worry, whatever you've decided to name it, is really showing up during games. And maybe there's something he could do about that. Maybe he could have a different conversation with his worry. Pull the worry out, have a conversation with it. But right now, it is your agenda that he play inspired soccer. Welcome to season six of Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about a family's anxiety and all the big feelings too. We tackle the serious stuff without being too serious. And I'm your co-host, Robin. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author. And I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. I'll give you concrete steps to take and the words to say. Hi, Robin. Hi, Lynn. So I just want to let you know that I am taping the finals of the Australian Open and that there are two big football games on this afternoon. Of course, my beloved Patriots are not even in the playoffs, which we are dealing with. Not well, but we're dealing with it. But this just leads us to today's topic, which is how do we deal with kids in sports and even in any kind of activity where performance is valued, you know? So it might be dance, it might be theater, it might be a soccer team. And what can we learn from having our kids participate in sports and other activities? And then where does anxiety show up and sort of make itself known in this arena? Because it certainly does. We get a lot of listener questions and comments about participating in sports, whether or not to participate, whether to keep them in the game when they clearly don't like it. And that's also very relevant if they hate piano. Do you make them keep playing piano? It's all about the ways that they enjoy or don't enjoy an activity, I guess, but it's also where certain patterns can really easily show up that might not have been triggered by academic work. Mm -hmm. That's right. I just actually was interviewed for an article, so we can link the article in the show notes. I posted it, the Today Show person, and it was about, do you let your kids quit in activity? When should kids be allowed to quit? So that's another issue, but I talk about that in the article. It really is an interesting thing because we want kids to do these leisure activities. We want them to have recreational activities. Competition can be fun. I'm competitive. I like to compete. I have played sports all my life. Some of the most fun that I've had in my life is being on teams and participating in things. But how do we manage when anxiety shows up? How do we handle a kid who just doesn't really like it, doesn't do what we want them to do? How do we handle all those challenges that come with performance anxiety, which is not a diagnosis, by the way, it's just a description of content. But how do we manage that as a family? We have two listener questions that I think really highlight what you're saying. But I also think you want to speak to the parents before we get into them, just about there's no such thing as sports anxiety, right? Correct. There's no such thing as sports anxiety. There's no such thing actually as test anxiety. These are just descriptions of the places where anxiety shows up, and the patterns are the same. So whenever a child or an adult is put into a situation where there's pressure to perform, where there's pressure to do well, and it can be external pressure, it can be internal pressure, where just based on the activity, you're supposed to do it well. You're supposed to score goals and not fall down. You're supposed to get the ball into the basket, into the goal, over the net. So whenever there's a situation in which somebody is being judged, where scores are being kept, right? We've talked about with games, like being a good winner and a good loser. Whenever you're in a situation with a team sport, for example, where you have to cooperate with other people, where you have to follow instructions, where there are some people on the team that are going to be better than other people on the team, all of these are places where anxiety shows up because remember, the very nature of anxiety is it has to be a certain way. And when we're playing sports, the whole nature of sports is it doesn't always go a certain way. Let's start with this first question. This is sort of dense with a lot of different things going on. Mm -hmm. My son loves soccer and we live in a soccer crazy community and almost all his friends play. They have soccer birthday parties. They wear their soccer jerseys everywhere. 
My son's athletic and talented enough that he made the all-star team last year. And he does well at practices and low-key kickarounds, but game time is a different story. He plays much slower during games than at practice. He would not challenge other players or take the ball away. And he walked a lot when he should have been running or jogging. And after the all-star season ended, he begged us to join a club team. So many of his friends already play club. And so we were conflicted about starting club so early, but he loves the sport. But we're back at the same place. His gameplay is slow, uninspired, and he seems stuck in his head a lot of the time. But when I watched him practice the other night, he was flying around having the time of his life and conversations about why he plays differently in games have not been fruitful. So we started to wonder if performance anxiety was holding him back in games. He has had fears at bedtime despite being in the same room as his younger siblings. He has a nervous lip licking habit that we've managed to replace with applying chapstick, which he now does 20 times a day. He's very aware of being judged in the negative way and not being the best. So maybe we don't need to do anything different when it comes to soccer, but it is frustrating to see him play with such low effort. The joy he professes for the sport and which we see at certain times just isn't there in the game. Is it really rooted in anxious thoughts? How can we help? Yeah, so that about sums it up. So you've got this boy, this 10-year-old boy, who loves to play. He loves to play soccer. He loves to run around with his friends. He loves to be joyful. He loves to move his body. He loves to be a part of a team. He loves to be included. All of this is really great for his development, for his social development, for his mood, for his energy. And then it comes to competing. And so here comes the anxiety pattern. And it shows up in other places, right? So sometimes people will say, he has trouble playing in soccer games. Well, actually, he has trouble managing when things are uncertain and when he feels uncomfortable and when he's being judged and when he doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. And what is his response? His response is to pull back. When somebody says, you know, his play is uninspired, I think that maybe you're using too sophisticated a word to describe, right? It's not uninspired. He's avoidant. He doesn't want to make a mistake. When people are anxious about something, when people don't want to step into this place of judgment and uncertainty, they pull back. It's just the same as a child saying, I love to sing. But during the choral recitals, the parents are sitting there mortified because their child's lips aren't moving. Or she loves to dance. You put music on in the house and she will dance and she loves to go to her practices and she loves her friends. And then she refuses to participate in a recital. It is the process of being judged and the worry about making a mistake that causes people to withdraw that causes people to step out of something that really takes the joy away. So what you're seeing is in a situation in which there is judgment, performance, grading, all those words, what you see is the joy disappears because the anxiety is so focused on being perfect, on making mistakes. And so what you want to think about with this is the goal in this is to teach your kids skills that are really helpful throughout life, whether or not they're in a job interview, on the soccer field, on the dance stage, whatever. And so talking to him, when you say to him, well, why don't you play in the games like you play in practice? Because you say you love the sport. And then when you're in a game, you're walking, you're not aggressive, you're uninspired, that why question, here's the answer. Because he's being judged, because he's being evaluated, because there's more on the line, because we have taken away the joyful play that he loves and put it into a context in which his anxiety is there to show up to say, if you're not perfect, we're out. This is also all or nothing thinking. So what I would do is I would let him keep playing soccer because he loves it and he's doing all of the things we want kids to do when they're playing as kids. And I would keep your mouth shut about the games. 
And I would observe to him that perhaps his anxiety, that really his worry, whatever you've decided to name it, is really showing up during games. And maybe there's something he could do about that. Maybe he could have a different conversation with his worry. Pull the worry out, have a conversation with it. But right now, it is your agenda that he play inspired soccer. I get it. You see him doing wonderful things on the practice field and you want him to do wonderful things on the game field as well. Does it bother him? Is he coming off the field and saying, oh, I played terribly. I wish I had done better. I wish that I could play in games like I played in practice. If that's the case, say to him, well, I think your worry is getting in the way. What do you think your worry is saying to you about games? And you might say to him, it sounds like your worry says, if you can't do it perfectly, you can't do it all. And so he's pulling back. So have those conversations with him, but don't make it the agenda is for him to play well in games. Make it the agenda is for him to be able to handle his worry when it shows up because it's showing up in a lot of places. He has a nervous lip licking habit that now he uses chapstick 20 times a day, right? You've replaced one habit with another. So you want to pay attention to this worry, but it's really not the soccer that's the issue. So when we come back, let's talk about how to practice these types of skills around performance that are showing up for a lot of kids. This episode is brought to you by Trumetta. It's a premium supplement company based out of California that strives to make self-care easy. One of their great products is mushroom coffee. It is a must for your morning routine and it tastes delicious. It has no mushroom aftertaste, only the benefits that mushrooms bring. And this organic premium coffee blend has lion's mane mushroom for productivity, reishi mushroom for immune support, cordyceps to boost your energy, and of course, caffeine to give you the kick that you need every day. Yeah, we need that caffeine. So start your 2024 healthier with True Meta Mushroom Coffee and see for yourself how it helps you to focus so you can get stuff done. You'll feel an uptake in your productivity every time you drink it. Trumetta offers their best deal to Fluster Clucks fans. You'll get a free electric mixer and 40% off the coffee plus free shipping in the U.S. So go right now to trumetta.com slash fluster to fuel your productivity and creativity with some delicious mushroom coffee. That's T-R-U-M-E-T-A dot com slash fluster. There's always one friend in the group that's really good at treating herself. I personally hope it's you. As you've taught me, maybe you opt for that extra leg room seat on the airplane. So when you treat yourself to top options, why settle when you're finding a doctor? Because it is your health. Yeah, enter ZocDoc. That's the place where you can find and book tens of thousands of top tier doctors, all with verified patient reviews. When it comes to your medical care, it's not the time to settle. Check out ZocDoc. It's the place where you can find and book doctors that will make you feel comfortable, listen to you, and prioritize your health. All these docs have verified reviews from actual real patients, and the typical wait time to see a doctor based on ZocDoc is between just 24 and 72 hours. That's it. You can even score some same-day appointments. ZocDoc is a free app. It's a website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. I use this to find a specialist for my kid. It works. Go to ZocDoc.com slash Fluster and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Fluster. ZocDoc.com slash Fluster. Picture that thing that you've always wanted to learn and now... Picture learning it from the person who's literally the best at it in the world. That's what you get with Masterclass. This year, learn from the best to become your best with Masterclass. And don't just talk about improving. Masterclass helps you actually do it. Masterclass offers over 180 world-class instructors, and you've heard all their names. So whether you want to master a negotiation with Chris Voss, think like a boss like Martha Stewart, or learn about comedy writing from David Sedaris, Masterclass has you covered. With Masterclass, you get unlimited access to intimate one-on-one classes with the world's best. I've learned so much from Masterclass and you will too. There are over 200 classes to pick from with new classes added every month. 
There are over 200 classes to pick from with new classes added every month, like learning mindfulness from the one and only John Kabat-Zinn. Every new membership comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So there's no risk. And right now, Flusterclux listeners will get an additional 15% off an annual membership at masterclass.com slash fluster. Get 15% off right now at masterclass.com slash fluster. Masterclass.com slash fluster. Okay, we're back. I just want to illuminate that you just also shared the whole arc and plot of Flashdance. Did I really? Yes, because she did not want to audition for the traditional conservatory. She was afraid of being judged. She had joy in dancing when it was at a strip club. (laughs) (laughs) Or when it was like just around her room. So sadly, this is not a movie to watch together as an emotional lesson. But I just want you to know that this is, in fact, a very common arc of overcoming that performance anxiety. And that's actually why, I mean, I was a kid when this movie came out, but I loved it. And you probably loved it, too. Oh, of course. We all cut our sweatshirts. Absolutely. And it was silly movie, but it was an analogy for overcoming our fear of being judged and just soaring. Yeah, I love that you bring that up. And again, I'm aware that we're always dating ourselves because what in a previous episode, we were like talking about Seinfeld and (laughs) right. I mean, (laughs) I know it was like, how do you say you're old without saying you're old? You do a dating episode on Seinfeld and Sex in the City. Right, right. Pass me my AARP membership. (laughs) Right. All right. Well, bear with us, younger parents, because this is where we are. So what are the skills we want to teach, right? That's what it always comes down to for me. It's always about the skills. And I love it. It's been such a game changer for me. It's a lens I look at everything now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just being able to recognize like your kid is very likely not going to play in the NBA, is not going to play for Manchester United. In fact, your kid is very unlikely to even get a full sports scholarship. It's incredibly competitive. And so we want to keep all of these activities that our kids do in the proper context. And the number one requirement for me is that it's actually playful and fun. And remember, competition can be fun. I mean, I had a lot of fun competing. So we want it to be playful and fun. But here are some of the other skills that I think that we can think about when we're putting our kids into this environment. For those that are thinking, like, what are the important things that I want to pay attention to? Number one is that it is a place for your kids to connect. Connection with peers, connection with people that they don't know from school, but they have other relationships with. A part of something that can feel really, really wonderful to kids And that we know, based on mental health outcomes, is that a sense of connection is critical for kids' mental health, particularly as they're going through their teen years. So remember that that's absolutely an important part of it. Individual sports, you can still have a sense of connection with the people that you practice with, with the other kids that go to the rock climbing gym, you know, that kind of stuff. The other thing is that we're really able to talk about routine and organization, autonomy, developing a sense of time. All of those skills are in the category of executive functioning. Sports is a really good way to help kids practice that. For example, if you know that practice starts at three, what time do we have to leave the house to get to practice on time? What do you need to do ahead of time? in order to be ready to play, helping kids learn how to pack their soccer bags or their hockey bags or their dance bags, what they need to do after practice. So it's a way to talk to kids about even about hygiene. Like, look, if you're going to go to basketball practice in the summertime, then part of what you need to do is take a shower when you get home because you stink. So there are all those things, developing a sense of autonomy, So letting kids have some say in what teams they want to join. My kids were on a rec basketball team in high school, which was actually like the most fun sport I ever watched. 
And they had to put the teams together themselves and they had to find a coach and they did it all themselves. And so by the time that they were sophomores in high school, they were organizing these things. Little kids, obviously, we're not going to take a bunch of six-year-olds and have them put together a t-ball team, but it's a really good way for you to develop those executive functioning skills, to work on those executive functioning skills. Emotional management, like we talked about in the winning and losing episode. How do we manage disappointment? How are we both good losers and good winners? How do we manage when we make a mistake or when somebody on our team makes a mistake? You know, I was watching a football game recently. I think it was the Bills game. And the guy kicked a field goal to tie the game, I think, to send it into overtime. And he missed the field goal with seconds left on the clock. And his teammates went up and sort of patted him on the back. And everybody was incredibly disappointed. How do we manage those big feelings? Which, connected to that, and this is something that I really watched a lot when my kids were playing Little League, how do we have kids that are kind and supportive of the kids that aren't the stars of the team? Because most of the time, we're going to have a team, particularly when they're little, we're going to have a team that's filled with better players and worse players. It is easy, parents. If your kid is the star, and it is really hard if your kid isn't. If you have a kid that's the star of the team, one of the most important skills that you can teach them is how to be kind to the kids that aren't, because it makes a huge difference in the way that those kids feel and the way that they connect and the way that they have a sense of belonging. No, you bring up a good point. If you have a child who is at the top of the team, if that child understands that helping others get there or supporting them and helping create a stronger team, that's like life leadership lessons right there. So that's a huge point. Yep. And I'm sure there are some parenting skills required. How do you show up with other parents and be a good parent on the team? If your kids are the top on the team too. Yeah, because I didn't have kids who were the stars. I mean, my kids are fine athletes and they found their sports actually, which they're very good at, but they weren't the stars of the team. I sat in the bleachers and listened to other parents say things about my kid. Oh God, he's up now. Oh shoot, man. We've got two outs and a man on second and he's coming up to bat. That is horrible as a parent to sit there. And I'll tell you, one time I turned around and I said, you know what? That's my kid. And I'm sure it feels really good that your kid is the star, but I think you need to not say those things out loud. I, on purpose, I mortified this parent on purpose. I think all of us are like cheering you on right now because that's completely uncalled for and inexcusable parenting behavior. Come on, guys. We can do better than that. Yeah. Okay. Can I tell you another thing that I did too? Lay it on. Well, this is more of a funny story. So I was at another baseball game and there was a grandfather there who was a total pain in the neck. And he was complaining about the coaching, that the coaches weren't doing this and the coaching wasn't doing that. My husband was the coach. I, at the time, was leaving a message on my voicemail for my son when this grandpa was chirping in my ear and I had had enough. So not ending the call. I turned to him and I said, hey, my husband is the coach. I need you to just shut your pie hole because I don't see you out there volunteering, actually. I see you sitting in the bleachers, drinking your soda, complaining about the parents that are out there putting in the time. And he said to me, well, maybe you shouldn't listen to me. And I said, oh, if only you were talking quietly enough that I didn't have to listen, I would be overjoyed. And the whole thing was recorded on my voicemail. Oh. <laughs> so my kid came home from wherever he was and like, oh, there's a message from mom. So there's me reaming out this guy. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I sort of enjoyed it. Right. I was I kind of liked listening to the voicemail. I was like, you go, girlfriend. That's right. 
But anyway, so that brings up a, another topic, like you say, I think which you're so right to bring up is that it's about what we as parents are modeling. There are so many things that parents are modeling during these activities and what they're saying and how they're cheering for their kids. And if you have an anxious kid, you really want to pay attention to a few really important things that have to do with perfectionism and superstition and OCD. We actually got another listener question. It's kind of similar to that. My son wants to be in team sports, but he has a hard time with games and more recent tournament time. He goes through lots of what ifs before games and he handled the loss really pretty well, but now he's backtracking and replays things that happen and gets hung up on things like bad calls. And he's even going so far as to say that the team jinx themselves by saying they were going to win. Yeah. When I read a question like that, or I hear a question like that, there are some of the little warning signs, right? There's the pink flag, not the red flag, but there's the flag that says, how does this context of sports, which can happen, again, It's this is just the context, this is just the content, but how does it show sticky brain and a little bit of this OCD perfectionism and then that superstition that comes in? We really want to make sure that when we're modeling for kids, when we're talking about winning and losing, We want to point out a few things. One is that if they are going back over things and over things, that's ruminating. They're trying to find where the mistake is. Their brain is stuck in that pattern of thinking. So we want to point that out to kids. And again, it is really helpful to talk to kids about sticky brain. I actually just did a Q&A with a school recently and teachers were asking, well, what's some language we can use with kids that sort of ruminate and are perfectionistic? And I talked to them about sticky brain and the comments afterwards were like, oh my God, that's such a great term to use. It's a real term, so use it. So we want to pay attention to that sticky brain going back over things as a pattern And then the other thing is in this listener question is there's that superstition thing. So there's jinx. They jinxed it that you can't talk about certain things. In the past, I talked about my son's little league coach that said you weren't allowed to cross the bats because that was bad luck. And my husband was all over that with my kids, right? That's not why we win or lose games. But it's really helpful and really important for families to be aware that this sports arena is full of superstition. It's full of OCD. It's full of trying to do things to prevent winning and losing that actually have nothing to do with winning and losing. And you just want to break that up. When that shows up in your family, you want to talk about it very directly. So use this as a way to talk about the trap, the lure, the stickiness of perfectionism and of superstition be very direct about it. Well, let's also acknowledge that the professional athletes who tend to have these patterns of superstition and stickiness, they may be excelling in their sport, but that pattern that they are so connected to is showing up in other parts of their personal life. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Let's just ask Giselle. Yeah. So... (laughs) But no, that's exactly right. If you are a professional athlete, that means you have all these people around you that are making their living off your perfectionism and your super, right? Nobody's going to say anything to you. They want it. They support it. So it's really helpful to point that out. I mean, I think that in the larger picture of things, whether we're playing sports or whether we're coaching sports or whether we're watching sports, there is a lot of stuff for us to sink our teeth into as examples of all of these patterns that I'm talking about. Sports is a great big metaphor for a lot of the things that kids will come up against in their lives and in their relationships. And we can take advantage of that. So one of the great reasons to have kids play sports, in my humble opinion, is because it is such fertile ground for learning so many of these important skills And if you've got an anxious kid and you can get them to step into this arena, to feel uncertain, to feel uncomfortable, to take some risk, to be a maniac on the dance floor, dancing like you've never danced before, then it really is great practice. And it's not just practice for soccer, it's practice for managing worry and uncertainty and stress and life and relationships 
It all is helpful. What a feeling. What a feeling. That's right. So when we come back, I want to come back to the parents because I can think of a couple of instances where parents wanted the whole team to participate in their kids' anxiety patterns. Oh, yeah. Me too. Let's talk about it. I'm always trying to think about how I can improve my health and feel better. And Thrive Market is one of the ways which is really helpful because they have filters that let me choose the things that are good for my health. For example, I'm really working on eating less meat these days, and they have vegetarian and vegan filters that bring products right in front of me. It makes it easy to shop and easy to choose. Thrive Market's my go-to for all my grocery and pantry needs and my household essentials. I get everything online and then I get it quickly shipped to my door and it's a huge time saver. I love those filters. Maybe you're looking for organic kid snacks or maybe your family is gluten-free. You can save money on every single grocery order and on average, I save over 30% each time. And they even have a deals page that changes daily, and it always includes at least one of my favorite brands. Yeah, like 7th Generation. That's a really great brand that I use. When you join Thrive Market, you're also helping a family in need with their one-for-one membership matching program. You join, they give. Join in all the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash flusterclucks. Thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks. You know, Robin, in the new year, people have resolutions and a big one is to save money. Stop shopping without getting anything in return. You can actually start getting cash back on every purchase you make with Ibotta. Ibotta is a free app that gives you the most cash back every time you shop on hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies to toys. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. The average Ibotta user earns $145 a year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip or even buy you a flight to somewhere amazing. Other apps will give you points that don't really amount to too much. With Ibotta, just add your offers in the app, upload your receipt, and you get real cash. Cash that goes into your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. Join over 50 million savers and earn cash back every time you shop from over 2,700 brands and retailers, including Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy, and more. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the code FLUSTER when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app to start earning cash back and use the code FLUSTER. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store and use the code FLUSTER. Okay, so now back to the show. I love that we're talking about the parents too, because that's not really what we were thinking of talking about, but I think we all need a check-in. I know of two instances where with a team, this one actually might've been yours, where there was a player on the young team, afraid of dogs, and then the parent asked every family not to bring dogs. And then I know a second one where the child had real anxiety about being late and always had to arrive very early. So then requested that the parents doing carpool have to come like 20 minutes early to accommodate that kid's rigidity about being early. Where are you using sports to ask the whole community to accommodate? Right. Yeah. So you're right. The dog thing, that was a client of mine. The child was afraid of dogs. And so the Mom would request that nobody bring dogs to soccer practice, which, of course, I said, stop doing that. The other issue, too, is when a parent wants everybody to accommodate their perfection and their superstition and their inability to manage winning and losing. We've got two things going on. We've got parents that want the rest of the team to accommodate, and then we also have parents that have their own issues of perfectionism that they are putting onto their kids and putting onto their team. 
I think I probably told you the story when my son's baseball team lost in the playoffs and the dad went up to the star pitcher and he was hugging him. And I heard him say into his kid's ear, you've let your whole team down. Yeah. So we have to think about how does our perfectionism, how does our superstition, how does our ego Think of how you want to cheer your kids on. Think of how you want to cheer the other kids on, just like those parents in the bleachers that I was talking to you about. Like, how does your family's anxiety issues, are you bringing them to the ball field Mm -hmm. and are you requiring or inadvertently asking everybody else on the team to participate in your cult of anxiety? So remember, it's a cult leader. So if a parent asks a school to participate in the cult, if a parent asks other family members to participate in the cult, it's very reasonable to think that they're also going to ask the dance studio or the soccer team or the chorus director to also participate in the cult. So you've got to really pay attention to how you're requiring or modeling, if you happen to be the coach, How are you modeling perfectionism? How are you modeling emotional management? How are you modeling OCD, superstition? How are you as a parent bringing that to the arena as well? Also, if you are letting your cult leader anxiety make requests of your child's team or dance troupe or whatever coming from a place of anxiety... I'm just going to be more direct because you're like beating around the bush. You shouldn't do that. And here is why. You are modeling for your kid that the world will accommodate things they find difficult and they will never gain the practice of managing the things that they need to work through so that they don't find them as difficult. Right. And the thing about sports, as I said before, is that it's a wonderful arena to practice all these skills. And if you come in and say, well, we're going to pick and choose and edit out which skills we're going to practice, it defeats the purpose. If you've got a kid who's afraid of vomiting, and so you put something into place, there are certain protocols that they have to follow so that the child who's afraid of vomiting doesn't get triggered. You're not giving your kid a chance, an opportunity to do that exposure which is really helpful. And some parents might say, well, she won't do cross country unless we can guarantee that nobody will throw up around her. Well, then you've got some choices to make. Either you step in and start to learn how do we deal with the uncertainty and the discomfort and the fear of somebody vomiting versus how do we arrange the world such that this child never sees anybody vomit, which by the way, is not possible. That's why it doesn't work, everybody. All these accommodation plans that we put in place, the reason they don't work is because they are impossible to pull off. You cannot go to a cross-country meet with a bunch of seventh graders and tell everybody what the rules are so that nobody vomits in front of your kid. But people try. They try. But it doesn't work. I didn't raise sports kids, so I didn't have these delightful experiences of competitive parents, but... I will say that the one time I went to this really populated Easter egg hunt (laughs) of these little kids, I was with your mom, who's my mother-in-law, and she and I were taking my little five-year-old daughter, and these parents were unconscionable, pushing and shoving before the egg hunt began. And then you would see them like, grab that, grab that, grab that. They wanted their kids to get all the eggs. Just goes to the point is that we can turn anything into a competition. Yes. Right? Yes. We have to have practice being healthy competitors and modeling healthy competition. Mm -hmm. Right. Which means that you step into the arena knowing that there are going to be mistakes. There are going to be disappointments. There are also going to be amazing victories. As hard as it is to watch your son drop the fly ball in the playoffs like my boy did so that they lost. As hard as that was, we could talk about it. And one of the older boys came up and was so nice to him, right? It was just the sweetest moment of an older boy saying to a younger boy that it was okay, but it was devastating. I've also stood next to moms whose son hit the home run that won the playoff game. I mean, what a feeling that must be. Again, I've done sports all my life and competition can be fun. It can be hard. Step into it 
and use it as an opportunity for your family to learn and practice all sorts of things that are just good human behavior. Thanks for listening. And if you found this podcast helpful, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find this information. And if you'd like to dig deeper on any of these topics, we have specialized playlists on our Spotify profile and the link is in the show notes. Topics like teens, depression, and OCD. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Robin. Oh, hey, everybody. It's us, Blair and Molly, your old pals from Toddler Purgatory. Two moms who are also actors, who are also creative beings, who sometimes feel stuck. And this is our new podcast, Unsticking It with Blair and Molly. What happens when your creative spark just seems to disappear? Gone. Poof. Bye. See ya. What happens when life gets in the way of your creativity instead of nourishing it? That's what happened to Molly and me. We felt like the thing that drove us creatively stopped working and impending doom had in fact impended. Totally. So we decided to do something about it. And that was steal ideas about getting unstuck from the most creative people we can find. We talked to guests about how to break through the mucky, gluey, sticky wall that can get between you and your creativity. We hear about their journeys, their successes, their challenges, and even their bougie coffee shop orders. Mm -hmm. And we're not just talking Bob Ross type paint on paper artists here, though we talk to them too. We're talking to actors, creative directors, dancers, and people who are working hard to be their best creative selves in a world that can sometimes feel real uncreative. We all have something to teach each other, so let's steal their ideas together. Join us, won't you, as we deep dive into how to unstick ourselves from the life gunk that can get in the way of our creative freedom. Pandemics, school calendars, world events, lack of sleep, oh, get out of their life gunk. And let's get back to your best creative self. Subscribe to Unsticking It with Blair and Molly. You're not going to want to miss an episode. Unsticking It with Blair and Molly, because sometimes life sucks. Unsticking